Live from the 607 is the ODPH Entertainment Edition, where we're talking movies, comics, TV, and more. Why don't you join in the conversation? Hashtag ODPH. Because here we go. Welcome to another edition of the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, or better known as Hashtag ODPH Podcast. I am your host, Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, it's Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to discuss, so let's waste no more time, shall we? We're going to be talking some entertainment co- topics, getting ready for San Diego Comic-Con, mm-hmm. because you know next week is our big San Diego Ooh. Comic-Con preview show. That's all we're going to be digging into for the next week. But this week, we still got some stuff to talk about. So, well, so yeah, the, the last couple weeks have seemed a little quiet. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, a lot of entertainment companies, movie companies, comic companies, TV show companies are kind of holding things back until they can let the cookie jar off the cookie lid off the cookie jar and you know spill the cookies out on everything they got planned right so we'll be covering that next week but fear not because we do have some topics to talk about this week so as always join in that conversation on our social media accounts we want to interact with you you can find links to all those on ochoduroparleyhour.com and always use that hashtag hashtag odph so let's kick it off with talking about one of our favorite shows Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Mm-hmm. Now, if you haven't been following this season, it has been a good one. Very a little weird. Getting a little weird. A little weird. But still is worth a watch. Now, you know we are going to be talking spoilers. So if you're not caught up, pause the episode, jump back into it, because we're going to start going into it in three, two, one. Pad, what did you think? Like the episode. Really good episode. Uh, just one question, though. Was there an Infinity War Endgame reference in this episode? I think there might have been a subtle one because if I am picking up on where I think the show is at this point, it's only a year after the snap. Right, because there's one point in the show where, you know, things are finally kicking off. You know, the, everything that's kind of been building up this season is kind of coming to a forefront. It's it's on their doorsteps, per, you know, metaphorically speaking. And, and Matt kind of looks at his team and goes, you know, we have to prepare for another uh elimination world elimination event and i'm like wait a minute what are they referencing here yeah they are tying in obviously to the events of infinity war and like i said the way i'm reading this is that they are about like a year or so after the event right because they've been very coy about where it's it's placed in terms of you know the avengers mcu timeline and they always have been to a larger degree unless they kind of you have an episode like a couple seasons ago where it was, you know, taking place right after Thor 2 took place. But outside of that, they're not really tying things in unless it's a casual mention here and there. But they've been very deliberate at not saying where it is. And I think that's very smart, yes, too. Yes, Because trying to tie in too much to Endgame, especially where the MCU is mm-hmm. at right now, mm-hmm. I mean, that is always up to debate. And well, so we can't forget, uh, you know, for... in. You know, spoilers, but the movie's been out for however long now, you know, so no no spoilers. But there is that five-year gap in between, you know, like the end of Infinity War and then where things really pick up in Endgame. Yeah, so where we're jumping in now, like I said, the most I've been able to figure out online by reading a couple sites and, and just ma- making my own deduction, we're about like a year to maybe 18 months after the okay, event. Okay. So that's where I'm kind of timeline in this. And as we jump in after the events of Sarge, who looks like Phil Coulson, mm-hmm. and, and that mystery is still up to date, Last episode, he wound up taking over S.H.I.E.L.D. to a degree. To a degree, yeah. Obviously, he is the one that has the biggest understanding of the Shrike and what it ties into the monolith and ties back into the mythos of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and their long history. He is now deliberating with the team about how to stop it because he is saying this is your extra extinction level event that you're yeah. not ready for and it's funny you know he keeps playing off the fact that he's not phil colson and yeah he might be he might not be we don't know yet but it's funny how very phil colson like he is in he knows a lot more than he's letting on or even telling them right and he is keeping his cards very close to his chest he is really trying not to let down his guard because He, I think, is just kind of going into this and saying, okay, these people know Coulson. They don't know me. Mm -hmm. I don't trust them. I don't trust anybody. I'm going to do just enough to make sure that my team and I are good. Yeah, and it's funny how many times, you know, he goes, oh, I'm not Phil Coulson. And I'm kind of sitting there going, sir, you are more like Phil Coulson than you know. Right. Just he is more deliberate and blunt, which Mm -hmm. I'm almost wondering if it's almost a split personality at this point. Oh, that could be. That maybe some trauma from Tahiti is now resurfaced but i don't know because i mean they do that with fits a lot with leopold so i don't know if they would do that for another character but you have to wonder what's going on there 
And as we're going through, we're seeing Mac is agreeing to the terms of letting uh, Sarge and his crew free. Very hesitantly. T- t- very hesitantly. And he sets his truck free, too, which, I mean, that's their big weapon mm-hmm. is his 18-wheeler. And he has part of his crew left behind. And he right. goes, well, in exchange, I'll let May and Quake go with you. Yeah. And you can join Snowflake on your your term, your, your trip, and then we'll kind of barter as that. And at this point, too, Deke is brought into the mix, and yeah. it's kind of the fallout from him stealing Shield Tech to become a millionaire. I mean, listen, you got to pay your your dues here, kid. Right. Which there is that weird romance apparently going on between him yeah. and Snowflake. Yeah, that we, was that was weird. It, it's odd. It's just very sudden, very odd. I understand his logic. Don't get me wrong. Like I've, he he gives an explanation. Of, you know, oh, I've been hurt. I've been this. But then I'm like, all right, see where you're coming from, kid. This is still weird. Right, because considering his lineage yeah. of Fitz and Simmons, this is not exactly the smartest move I've seen done on the show. But no. I digress. Where we go with that is is interesting, but it's going to be a, a little comic relief because of the seriousness going on. But as we know from what we've seen with the show, S.H.I.E.L.D. always has kind of an ulterior motive going on as well. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously being the first line of defense. And Max's plan is to assist Sarge if needed, but he is also making sure that the Zephyr is an heir ready to back them up as needed. Mm-hmm. And at this point, too, we kind of go to the space odyssey of where Fitz and Simmons are and Izel, who is now bringing them to Earth. And lo and behold, which they kind of tip the cat a little too much about this last episode, too. We find out that she is the head person of the Shrike Mm -hmm. that is coming to Earth and is making these parasites. And we don't really know the reason behind it, but we just know that she is on her way to Earth. And at this stage, too... Quake and Sarge are having a convo as they flash back to Earth. They do a lot of jumping around again, yeah, too, which, yeah. it, you know, it, it makes sense, but it kind of throws me for a loop at times, too, because it's just back and forth, back and forth. But at this stage, though, Quake and Sarge are having a convo, and Sarge is being very defensive about that past. Mm-hmm. And Quake is really trying to dig at him, and Sarge is smart enough to know what's going on. He sees the play happening, and he's calling the audible right then and there, which is smart on his yeah. point, too, because... Yeah. He understands Quake, it, especially if he is Coulson, which... He might be. He might be. He understands how this team works. So They haven't outright said he's not, so eh, we don't know. They've said DNA-wise, he is. But as far as personality, up for debate. And at this point, too, he is naming the story about how Azel came to his planet and destroyed his home world, killed his family, and that's his reason for vengeance, which makes sense yeah. to a degree, yeah. but he's really not going into the whole deal. But he's painting the picture of how Izel is the one that is in trouble or causing the trouble and is coming to Earth now, and he has to do what he has to do. And at this point, too, Izel is talking to the artifacts that are the bridge to life and claims that Sarge knows the real truth of what's happening. So it's all about who do you trust, which fits into the S.H.I.E.L.D. motto, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, yeah. Because it's always what's really going on. And right. especially if you're a head of a spy organization, you really want to make sure that you're on top of everything. Oh, so you're the head of a spy organization not long removed from having your entire agency ripped out from under you because the people, you know, like half or three quarters or whatever the percentage is, I don't know, uh, people who work with you and were your brothers and sisters, metaphorically speaking, you know, were, oh, hey, we're not the people you trust. We're the people you should hate and be fighting. Right. S.H.I.E.L.D. was infiltrated by Hydra. They didn't yeah. see it coming. I mean, it's not that long ago. Right. Like, it feels like a long time ago, but like in terms of number of years, it's not that long ago. It's not that long ago. And in this stage, too, I mean, Mac is trying to figure out what is going on with this. So, obviously, it's whose story do you believe? Do you really trust Sarge? Or uh, for Fitz and Simmons, who are hearing the story, do they really trust Izel? Because mm-hmm. as far as they know, they're bringing her, them to back to Earth. So, if they're trusting in her, they kind of have to go along with her play. But as they start finding out that she is... Not really up to what she is saying. Mm -hmm. And she's hatching one of those parasites that we saw kill the agent when it was on Earth. Yeah. And is infecting the crew that they are riding with back to Earth. And there really isn't a lot of detail going on, but she is trying to say about how it's the bridge of life. So is it really? We don't know. Yeah. What exactly is the ploy? And at this point, Izel's story is just saying that she's trying to track down the power source and really trying to figure out, okay, what's stopping her from, you know, getting these monoliths back Mm -hmm. to her and then the history of that. And like I say, at this point too, Sarge is 
nearly like at his wits end because yeah. he's been pushed the limit by Quake. He's coming back to try figuring out, okay, he gave Deke a project to do. Mm-hmm. Deke is messing around with Snowflake, which is, uh, like I said, it's it's an odd moment in the show. It's comic relief, but really feels forced. Yeah. Really. A little bit. Re- yeah, really not gelling with the rest of the storyline. But at this stage, too, Sarge walks in and nearly kills him mm-hmm. for not his machine not working. Yeah. Which is interesting, but it's also really separating Sarge from Coulson and the personality. So we'll say we're... Sarge, very short fuse. Coulson, yeah, slightly longer fuse. Slightly longer fuse, a little more cool, calm, and collective. Yeah. Sarge is a little... I Fly don't, off the cuff. I don't want to say unhinged, because I think that's no, a wrong wording, no. but he is very, like... He's, he more easily flies off the handle. Yeah, he's just more animated, I guess, is kind of the way I would treat it. And at this point, too, they're flashing back to Fitz and Simmons, who are squabbling yet again. And yeah. It's kind of been their story this entire season that they're just going back and forth, back and forth. Well, and, and Fitz can't give up the fact or get over the fact that, oh, you know, he, he this isn't going to be the first time Gemma gets married. Right. And obviously, this is bringing back a lot of memories of when she was on the, the alien planet way back mm-hmm. when. And obviously, one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s best episodes, if you get the chance to go back and watch, I believe, season three. So the remnants of this, I mean, I love the fact that everything with Fitz and Simmons this season is tying back to their history Mm -hmm. and really digging into it, which I don't know if it's foreshadowing that one of them is not going to survive this. Nah, maybe. I mean, Fitz would be the obvious idea, but it could be Simmons. I mean, how they're kind of just having them go back and forth in the history of the two characters. It's really interesting to see that, and I think there's a lot more going on with that. Than I say it almost—it almost feels like they've got like a Shakespearean tragedy style story going. Just, just the two of them, you know, not the show itself, but just their story in general. Where, you know, whenever they get close to having a happy moment, something happens, and it just, you know, puts a fork in the road. Yeah. And at this stage, too, they flash forward to Yo-Yo, who's talking with Sarge's team, and she's talking with everybody that's been captured, Jaco. And really just trying to dig into, okay, what's going on? And they're just going so much back and forth about this. And you're, she's hearing the story of how Izel feeds on hate and killed Sarge's family. And Sarge, you know, is planning on, you know, stabbing her with a sword. And that's the only weapon that can kill her, which I'm just going, you know, something just sounds fishy about this whole nonsense. Mm-hmm. No, like, no matter how it comes down, it's like, you're really going to just go swashbuckling, if I can use that term? It, yeah, sure. It just kind of finds fishy. But, I mean, at this point, the Shrike that's already been infected on Earth are now meeting at their point, and they're beginning to transform to make some temple figure. Uh, Fortress of Solitude, duh. Yeah, it's just like, okay, this is getting interesting. Uh, not the way I saw the story happening, but no. it is. But this, but the way it's getting portrayed is once the temple is being built, it will spread the Shrike throughout the Earth. Which, which, is, which is not a good thing. No, it definitely isn't at this point. And as we see, Izel has already infected the crew, so you know that once everybody's infected, either they're going to fall in line with her or be killed from the easiest thing I can yeah. figure out. And at this point, too, the team is making the claim that Sarge is going to just destroy the planet because at this point he's killing an agent and he's trying to get free on the – or his crew is rather is trying to – is mm-hmm. k- kills an agent to get free. And then they get captured by Yo-Yo, but they're claiming Sarge is going to destroy the planet and this has all just been a suicide mission from the get-go. I will say you really can't trust the guy. At all. Right. You can't trust anybody. I mean, Jayco is making up the other character, which escapes me right now. He's making up stories. Everybody is making up a story to save their own mm-hmm. skin, which I love the fact that, okay, everybody's flipping, so you don't know who to really believe. No. And you can't really put any trust in it, so you have to make the judgment as the viewer, okay, whose side do you really believe? I think the only sure factor that we know is Izel is up to something. Mm-hmm. The way you're infecting people with yeah. symbiotes and parasites, whatever you want to define it as, something is not right there. And as we find out about Sarge, he, as soon as he learns about Pax, that's the character I'm trying to think of, oh, who snitches about the bomb, then that's kind of when he goes, I don't want to say unhinged, but this is when he goes, okay, I'm taking care of this one mm-hmm. way or another. And as it winds up... The truck is actually the weapon, and it has yeah. a bomb on it. Which explains why earlier in the episode he was so, like, like Mac didn't want to give him the truck. He's like, no, you can't have the truck. And he's like, no, you're going to give me the truck. Essentially, he's like, no, you're going to give me the truck, or I'm going to put a bullet in your head. Yeah. So this pro- goes to the mystery of the truck that has actually been a weapon at this time. Mm-hmm. And in Sarge does leave May and Quake and Deke and Snowflake on the on the truck. Yeah. Where they're kind of trying to figure, okay, what do we do with the bomb? And then Deke finds it in the water tank, it looks like, that's on there. But Sarge at this point has escaped, and the plan has always been to take over the Zephyr. 
So Sarge has been two steps ahead of everybody. This yeah, time. yeah. When Mac and crew thought, oh, he doesn't know about this effort. He only he, he only knows about this base. He doesn't know about our moving base. Nah, he knew the whole time. No, because he has it wired that the truck is going to go straight into the portal or uh, to the light temple. Yeah, the temple. No, it's the temple. Oh, okay. He's going right into the temple with it. But he escapes via a portal through Jaco's coat, mm-hmm. which is wild. To me, like I mean, it's very smart, but it just proves how smart he is because he, once he gets through and he escapes through that portal, that's where they go. And then Deke is finding the bomb. Sarge is now in the Zephyr. Yeah, Izel is now finally entered Earth's atmosphere. So everybody's meeting at a head, and we fade to black. Because mm-hmm. this is part one of a part uh, two part uh, story, right? So now we go into it, going, okay, what happens from here? Does Shield? somehow get rid of the bomb in time and then Izel arrives to Earth and what happens then? So, Pat, I guess a lot more questions than we thought we were going to have at, at the end of this episode. Yeah, definitely so. I mean, that's to be expected, though. I mean, like I said, it's part, part one of a two-part episode and then, we, you know, we got another episode on the 19th and then an episode on the 26th before they take a little bit of a break. You know, there's some break time in there, but, you know, I'm expecting, like, proverbial fireworks at the end of the next episode. Well, it has to be. I think at this stage, Sarge is now making his final play. Because if he's escaping on the Zephyr, he knows that the truck is going to put a crater-sized explosion. Well, how big did they say it was? It was like 200 miles or something like that? Give take. It's going to be big. And like I said, it's going to wipe out a good chunk of Earth, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, it'll take out Izel, but then again, Fitz and Simmons are on that plane, or on the spaceship. What happens there? And then Enoch is now slowly lurking about. So I got a feeling he might come back into play. But overall, though, Pad, a lot of questions we said have mm-hmm. answers going into this season. I mean, overall, what has been your your take on the season thus far? You know, just when I thought the show couldn't get any weirder, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, just in kind of like the the bizarre places they can go with it, they proved me wrong. Yeah, this season has been interesting thus far, and especially have after how they capped off last season which last season was perfect. They never needed to do another episode again, and I think a lot of fans would have been happy. But this season has been good, though. It's different. It's very different. It kind of has... I'm trying to make a comparison, but I, I it's really hard to do because it almost... With all the time travel, I want to say Doctor Who, but that's not that's not a fair statement. I yeah. think I think it's more so... This is not the S.H.I.E.L.D. story we were expecting, and especially... If this is what's going to explain what they've been up to between Infinity War and Endgame, it's really interesting to see how this plays out because obviously there's been no connection made with Endgame, and I don't think there's going to be. I mean, Marvel TV and Marvel Studios movies don't really have a lot of interaction. They don't get along. Not really. Not necessarily. Even though I will say this, though. I'm going to sidetrack just for a second. Okay. I know Endgame is now however many millions right behind Avatar. Mm-hmm. Why don't they just do this? If you want to put the cherry on the proverbial Sunday here, insert cameos of everybody from Marvel TV into the scene where everybody's coming out of the portal. Won't happen. I know it won't happen. But I'm just saying, if you really want to add something to it that would make people actually really excited to go see it again in a, you know, for this time after it's been re-released, that would be the way to do it. I don't I don't think so. It's not going to happen, though. No, no, not even just that. I don't think that would be the thing to do it just because, you know, they just put it out recently with the bonus scene uh, that they added after the Spider-Man trailer came out plus some added stuff to it, and it really didn't give it that much of a bump. I don't think adding TV characters who, admittedly, I'd like to see the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in there, but won't happen. I'd love to see the, the Netflix people in there, but well, that won't happen. There, there's a lawsuit coming, right? No, but it, you know, as much as I, but if you the, they added this stuff in before, which is added, I, I think it added what like another six minutes or something. Give to the take, film. yeah. Adding another fifteen seconds won't do it either. But I'm just saying, if there was something, okay, then that might be a special edition or something to really, yeah. To if you're going to do it again, which I mean, like I said, the first time was like okay, and I know that they really want to try taking out Avatar before the, everything comes out on Blu-ray and digital yeah. release. So yeah. I mean, if you're going to do something, that might be something to incorporate. But is it going to happen? Probably not. No, like I said, if, if the, it'd be cool. Don't get me wrong; they could do the Agents of Shield, Agent Carter type things because they own those properties. But like I said, if they use anything from the Netflix universe, there is an instant lawsuit coming down the pike. Right. But I say they have enough talent if they want to try doing Cloak and Dagger, Runaways. Yeah, yeah. There are loopholes around certain things you can do. Like I said, you could even have Hugh Jackman just come walking out as Hugh Jackman. 
That'd be I, that's that's uh, that's too much of a headache. I know, but just I'm saying you could throw him a real curveball in there because, like I say, if you had Colson and company walk through, I mean, obviously there'd be a lot of explanations going on of how they disappear through the time hole. Right. But at this stage, though, I mean, anything is possible, and especially. Now I I think the MCU timeline is really thrown off because of what's going on with Loki, yeah, and let alone now yeah. with Fitz and Simmons because that's time tampering, that right? It's gonna just get real messy, and I think that's the overall theme of this the season thus far. It's been great, mm-hmm. I really have enjoyed it. Oh yeah, but it is really getting confusing with all the time jumping and such, and the ramifications of that moving forward. Because like we say, season six is already filmed, season seven is going to happen. That's already been confirmed. Where they go from here is anybody's guess. But going into next week's episode, I'm expecting a lot of fireworks. I'm expecting a, you know, a real start slowly of a payoff, maybe an explanation of Sarge is Coulson or is he not and how this is all to be. A lot more questions to be asked, though, but we're going to be here to do it. But we want to ask you, what's your thoughts on the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? What was the thoughts on this past episode, and what's the thought of the season overall thus far? Hit us up on the hashtag ODPH. Let's have that conversation, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Vince, the Cowan Man CTO, a local MMA fighter, telling you to keep on listening to the ODPH, the 607's up and coming newest podcast. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. And there was some big streaming news. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not talking about Stranger Things big numbers, which, by the way, spoiler free, fantastic. Okay. Loved it. Um, Might do a blog about it. Just can't say enough rave reviews about it. But Netflix had a huge winner on their hands. But there was also some some other, I guess you could say Netflix news per se. Per se. But it's going to tie into what we're going to discuss now, Mm -hmm. which is HBO Max. Yes. Now, the big news coming out of this was Friends is leaving Netflix. Right. And there was, and obviously everyone got up in a tizzy a couple months ago when it was going to leave initially, but then Netflix ponied up money to have it on there for another year. But in 2020, Netflix, uh, Friends will be leaving Netflix proper, like Dunzo for good. And we finally know why, because uh, Warner Media announced HBO Max. Now, HBO Max is kind of a misnomer, I guess you could say, because it's not coming from HBO. Right. HBO is included, but it's, it's the title they're giving the uh, for the Warner Media stri- or the D- Warner Brothers streaming service. Now, the Warner Brothers streaming service, for those who may not know, has been rumored and and kind of you know discussed for God got to be going on a decade because I first remember hearing about it that way back in like 2011, 2012, 20, you know, somewhere in there where law abiding citizen used to be on Netflix. Yeah. And I remember watching it and I, you know, with some friends and a couple weeks went by and I wanted to watch it again and it was off Netflix. And that's where I was like, Hey, what the heck happened? And I started doing some searching and Warner brothers had pulled everything wholesale off of Netflix because they were getting ready to launch their own streaming service. Mm. Never panned out, never happened. Rumors have run rampant for for years, but now they're officially coming out with it. And like we said, it's called HBO Max. We don't have a release date yet. All of the uh, video says, uh, and the announcement video says, is 2020. So you know, there's 365 days in 2020. Who's to say when it'll be? But it is titled HBO Max, and it is anything. Well, almost anything uh, that Warner Media owns will be on there. Uh, that includes. Uh, sites and and tv channels such as uh hbo warner brothers pictures and anything warner brothers related uh dc true tv cartoon network tbs tnt cnn adult swim boomerang new line cinema the cw turner classic movies crunchy roll and rooster teeth and and the kind of crazy thing with this is they're going to get stuff like the fresh prince of bel-air friends you know, they uh, Warner Brothers, of course, owns Looney Tunes, so they're probably going to get every single every lo- single Looney Tunes, Looney Tunes cart- yeah, that's ever been made, from the great ones to the new ones that are eh, so so. You know, they're going to get Lord of the Rings, they're going to get it, they're going to get Harry Potter, they're going to get the Hobbit. You know, they're gonna, you, you think of any big you know Warner Brothers movie, 
that they put out or they at least own the people who put the thing out, it's going to be on there. Now, not everything will be on there because there are some, you know, there are going to be some MGM classic movies on there because of the, I presume, because of the Turner classic movies. You have to tie so, in yeah. because if you turn on Turner classic movies, it, it, odds are it's an MGM film nine times out of ten. But there are uh, there are some other films that in that collection that I guess won't be included at least yet because of some already pre-existing streaming deals they've got, but you know, Blade Runner is in, would be in there. Casablanca, you know, dirty, Harry gremlins hangover. Like I mentioned before, Harry Potter, the hot in the Hobbit, you know, you've got the it movies, uh, the Lego movies, lethal weapon, Looney tunes, Mad Max, the matrix, uh, you know, the monster verse with Godzilla and anything Godzilla never ending story, you know, police Academy, space jam, Willy Wonka, you know, the Harry Potter prequel films, you know, Beetlejuice, Charlie and the chocolate factory, you know, dirty, Harry, uh, free Willy franchise, you know, I, the list goes on and on and on, but it, you, you don't think about it when you're sitting there watching a film and you see the Warner brothers logo, you know, a lot of times, you, you sit there in the beginning of a movie and you see the company logos and you just kind of go, oh, okay, whatever. Let's just get to the movie. Right. This is really big news. Yeah. Really yeah. big. Because if you break it down for everything that's going to be offered on this service, and like I said, Pat was nailing a lot of those stories. I mean, we and they're still adding more from, mm-hmm. from what we can tell. Yeah. For the CW, this is huge. Yeah. Because after this year. Well, starting this year. Starting this year, rather. Any new programming like Batwoman is going to be solely streamed on the uh, HBO Max. Right, and I think this needs explaining because I, I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but it just needs to kind of be like explained in detail. Any show that was produced or started before 2019 on the CW, so Arrow, Flash, Supergirl, Legends of Tomorrow, Black Lightning, will still end up on Netflix. It's not going to be the two weeks like it is now because that deal has ended. Right. They had a de- uh, CW had a deal worked out with Netflix where well, example I can give is Walking Dead. Walking Dead gets done in what like uh, April or May in usually. May. April or May. Walking Dead gets done in April or May. The the previous season doesn't end up on Netflix. I want to say until a week before or a week the week of the new se- new season. So that's kind of where it is for that. But with uh, CW and Netflix, it was, you know, if you're sitting here and it's like, let's just say it's the 4th of July and, you know, uh, season of CW got done. Two weeks from that air date, the whole season will be up on Netflix. That was how it was. That's not going to be the case now. It'll still end up on Netflix, just not as fast. Anything started or that is started in 2019 or later so like uh, ken said batwoman or i guess they're doing a riverdale spinoff series anything that is started or new in 2019 will not go to netflix it'll be on the hbo max streaming service yeah this is huge news because for a long time this has been synonymous with netflix and Mm -hmm. a lot of that programming is now leaving netflix and going to their own and one area that I know I'm jumping the gun at, because if you listen to the show a lot, you know I talk DC Universe on mm-hmm. here. And you know Doom Patrol is my show. Yeah. I like Titans. Swamp Thing, unfortunately, has been canceled, mm-hmm. and maybe this has something to tie in with this if if everything's getting moved to the streaming service. So the question now becomes, what is the fate of the DC Universe involving HBO Max? Right, because DC stuff is included, so presumably any DC movie, past, present, and future, is going to end up on that service. Because to my knowledge, the DC stuff, movie stuff, has never ended up on Netflix, if I'm not mistaken. Stuff like stuff like Man of Steel and Batman Superman and, and, and Justice League never ended up on Netflix. So... You know, I think it ended up on HBO because HBO is owned by Warner Media, who owns DC. But you know, you'll just roll that into this. So you got to figure, you know, the Christopher Reeve movies, the uh, Tim, Michael Keaton, Michael Keaton, and Val Kilmer, and George Clooney, and and Christian Bale, and and you know Ben Affleck. You know, uh, Batman movies will be on there. Like anything DC has ever made. And I would go so far as to say even the sh- the animated stuff is going to end up on there, too. But the, the future of the DC Universe is kind of left up in the air. Because if you go to the uh, video on the HBO Max YouTube channel, uh, it's a 43-second video. If you go into 33 seconds exactly, because th- they're going through kind of like a running, you know, you got to pause it every, two, every second to kind of see every logo they're flashing at you. But 33 seconds in, you see DC Doom Patrol, a DC Universe original. 
the, you know, so the future of the DC universe, at least to, now I know some people are running with all this kind of lens credence to they're just going to roll it into this. Maybe, maybe not. I, I kind of say it's still up in the air because I feel like if they were going to roll it into that, you wouldn't see the a DC universe original on there. Yeah, this is just kind of puzzling, too, because especially DC had announced that on the DC Universe app, they were putting the entire comics library up right. very soon. So if you're doing that, I mean, unless you're going to roll that into just kind of like how Marvel has Marvel Unlimited for their mm-hmm. comics, maybe something right. like that. But right. it, I mean, they, they may also leave it entirely separate because you may have some people that just want the DC stuff. They don't want, you know, the Turner Classic movies and they don't want Cartoon Network. They don't want, you know, Crunchyroll. They don't want True TV. They don't want TBS or TNT or anything like they just want DC. Yeah. It's all they care about. They may leave it as its own separate thing. So, hey, you can still get your your DC stuff and your comics and your this and your that. But I think what they may end up doing is saying, hey, you can get all of that and then everything else if you want it too, with HBO Max. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be just real puzzling to see what they do. And I imagine, I have to imagine that next week at San Diego Comic-Con, there's going to be a little more explanation about this. I think this. there has to be. Because if I'm not mistaken, like I said, we're going to kind of dig into it a little bit. Doom Patrol is going to be, I believe, have something to do at at San Diego Comic. Probably that at least something with DC Universe. I think is going to have is going to be involved there. Probably. Which I mean, like I say, if they cancel Doom Patrol, I'm going to go absolutely bananas about this. I don't think they will. I don't think they would either. I mean, Doom Patrol has definitely earned its. I mean, you, if you have not started watching it, what are you waiting for? It's a perfect streaming show. All the episodes are up right now in the DC Universe. Make it a point to watch it because it's phenomenal. But I digress. Because if I lose that in Deadly Class in the same year, it's going to get ugly on here. Just going to tell you right now. Mm-hmm. But getting back to what we're talking about, though, I it's it's very puzzling to see what they're going to wind up doing. I can't imagine they would get rid of the DC Universe. No, I can imagine they might they might shift it around because if they want to air all the animated stuff, mm-hmm. like Batman the Animated Series and all the cartoons on there, yeah, and the animated films on HBO Max, I can understand that. If they want to put the original programming on mm-hmm. there, I get that. But it comes now the question, okay, what about the comics and what right. do you do there? And like I said, the only thing I could see them doing is maybe rolling that out to just a strictly comics format. Well, the thing of it, this, see, this is kind of where I think it's going to go in that, it, you know, because you're going to have some people who want all the stuff I mentioned, all the channels and all the companies I mentioned. But you're also going to have the people who just don't care and they just want the DC stuff. So they're going to leave the DC thing as its own separate thing and leave it at its own price. But if you're going you're gonna to have the people who are going to want it, it, maybe not all of that, but they're going to want, you know, this, the Warner Brothers movies. They're going to want the HBO stuff. They're going to want, you know, the, the old cartoons. They're going to want the New Line Cinema stuff. They're going to want this and that. They'll believe, they'll, okay, you just want the DC stuff. You know, DC Universe is for you. If you want the DC Universe stuff plus everything else, here's another service for you. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be just a really interesting thing to watch. Because like, the other thing is that they got adult, or uh, excuse me, Boomerang on there. That's every Hanna Barbera cartoon. Right. Like like I remember that very distinctly from when I was a kid and they would show during you know mainly during the days when in the summer when I was off from school, but you'd have, you know, Yogi Bear, uh Huckleberry Hound and, and you know all the classic Hanna Barbera cartoons and they'd have that intro like if you look it up on YouTube, any kid who grew up in the 90s will know that outro from when they got done showing a Hanna Barbera cartoon and it and it had such like a Turner classic property or something like that like so that's every Hanna-Barbera cartoon and plus they're also going to be doing original programming yeah too. yeah they're, they're doing a dune spinoff right or, or at least a, something tying into the upcoming dune film yeah they're also going to be doing a uh, gremlins animated series among other things yeah tokyo vice i believe is having a show yeah and greg bertinelli has a show called the flight attendant yeah which if i'm not mistaken kaylee kyoko from big bang theory mm-hmm. that's going to be her next project that she's yeah. doing so they and they have a couple more shows coming out for that. So I mean, overall though, and especially you're getting all this. They haven't announced a price point yet. No, I w- I'm going to make a guess because we were trying to talk about this off air. If HBO is somewhere around the realm of what 15, 17 bucks a month, fifteen bucks a month, yeah. You got to imagine this is going to have to be somewhere around that price point too, right? And so HBO, if with your cable package, it, from what I've been reading, is fifteen a month. And then, if I'm not mistaken, HBO launched a streaming service where you could get their stuff without a, because before you needed a cable package to get any of their right, stuff. you needed to be signed up for it. But they offered, and I'm blanking on the name of if if there's some streaming service, it's HBO something where I want to say it's like 
20 a month or something like that. It was HBO Go or HBO, HBO, HBO Now? HBO Now is what it is. Thank you. HBO Go is the app where if you have a cable sign-in to use. Yeah. HBO Now is what the, the streaming service is. If I'm not mistaken, H- and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I, I think HBO Now is $20 a month. So, I, you know, and obviously Disney Plus is coming in with like $7.99 a month. I can't see them with those prices in mind dropping it to that competitive price. My guess is it's going to be in the neighborhood of $15 a month. So let me ask you this then. With all that information given to you, mm-hmm. there's Netflix, which is what, right around thirteen ninety nine a month? Twelve ninety nine a month, thirteen ninety nine a month, yeah. You have Disney Plus, which is mm-hmm. gonna be the best deal of the bargain. Yeah. Seven ninety nine. Yeah. If this is now gonna be open and let's say it's around seventeen a month, mm-hmm. are you jumping on this? Maybe. I mean I kinda gotta see what they're offering and what it's going for first, because fifteen. If it ends up being in the fifteen dollars, fifteen dollars a month is a lot. Yeah, like you know, Netflix is already getting to that point for a lot of people where it's getting to that point where it's like, all right, it's starting to get a little expensive, and you're and anything big that they'd want to watch, TV shows or movies, getting added or kind of getting pulled away. So it's kind of losing that luster it once had. Where oh, we're the the one stop shop for any streaming movie you want. For this, it's enticing and it's cool, but. I got to kind of wait and see what the price point is going to be and then what they end up offering. Yeah, for me, this is going to be very intriguing. And what I mean by this is I am a big DC fan. Right. Obviously, like I said, I talk about DC Universe a lot on the show. Depending on what happens with that, like since I am a member and I wonder if, how they're going to roll that in, right. since, you know, what my price point is going to be with that. I'm really curious about it, and especially now – with the current influx of streaming services mm-hmm. that NBC is going to be doing one, I believe yeah. too. Yeah. CBS has all access. I mm-hmm. don't, I don't subscribe to that. It's nothing personal. Like I said, I just no interest. Yeah. I already have enough on my plate with Netflix too. And especially with Netflix losing all this now losing Marvel. Right. And the MCU shows and, and Disney and Disney. I mean, that's a crushing blow to them. Like, I realize... And Star Wars. Yeah, Star Wars. Star Wars, too. Yeah. I mean, I realize, uh, what is it, Mary Poppins Returns just got added to Netflix, but, like, the list of Disney movies getting added to Netflix here is becoming very... That are going to be added to Netflix is becoming very short. If not, Mary Poppins Returns might have been the last. Like, I know I know Marvel movies are done being added to Netflix because Ant-Man and the Wasp was going to be the last one on there. Yeah. So now moving forward with that, I mean, the only comic show that I... I'm thinking it is out right now. I know there's probably more coming Mm -hmm. is Umbrella Academy. Right. Which I know is, was greenlit for season two. Mm -hmm. After that, I mean, there's not a lot of comic movie per se on there. Like I said, I could be wrong and please feel free to hit me up on OD parlay hour on Twitter. And right. Well, and this is where you might start seeing more of the image and, and kind of the indie or dark horse stuff get done by Netflix because DC's got their own thing with, with Warner media now in the DC universe app. Mar- Marvel's got Disney, and mm-hmm. they, they got their whole thing. So you got to presume anything anything Marvel has ever thought about doing, but th- thought, eh, that wouldn't make a good movie. They can probably turn it into a uh, short series now. You know, in in the vein of what they're doing with uh, Falcon Winter Soldier or even Loki, where okay, it it might not be a full 13, 20 episode season, but it might be you know six, seven, eight episodes. That might be where you see the Dark Horse or the Image or any other these you know, other indie comics turn to Netflix and go, hey. You're not getting anything DC. You're not getting anything Marvel. Here's an option for you. Well, it's a great option to open up if that is the case. I mean, for any independent comic company like Dark Horse, which has tons of properties yeah, they can run with. Yeah. Image, I mean, if you want to really focus maybe on like uh, the Extreme Studio stuff, I know that was kind of rumored that Youngblood and, and such maybe was going to be up in the air for your options. I haven't heard anything lately. Right. So if it is, I, I hope it is. I mean, I'd like to see any comic get on screen and, and do something with it. Or even Valiant, which, I mean, yeah. I know has some movies coming out. And yeah. I tell people, don't sleep on Valiant. Valiant has some great books. So say, work, you know, if I'm Netflix, work on a deal with Valiant to get the stuff added on there, like, the month after it leaves the, uh, the theaters. Yeah, I mean, it would make a lot of sense, too. It, this is just going to be such a unique period in time. I mean, we... I mean, I know the streaming service has always had a, like kind of a you know an influx, and there's mm-hmm. always been something. Yeah. But now, if you look at how everybody's setting up, how the end of the year is going to go, and then mm-hmm. depending on when this drops, which if I have to make an unofficial guess, I'm going to say summer next year. Probably. Summer 2020. Because I think the minute Disney Plus hits in November, yeah. and everything that's coming with it, especially for that price point, mm-hmm. 
everybody's going to jump on it. Oh, God, yeah. I, I think that is probably the no-brainer of no-brainers. Like, the Disney Plus thing had their big announcement, and everything that was coming with that and the price point, and I had a family member text me, like, the day after and go, so you're getting Disney Plus, right? Oh, yeah, I already circled that yeah. day as soon, yeah. as, you, as soon as you can sign up for it. And like I said, I am not doubting that you're going to hear something about this at San Diego Comic-Con. Mm-hmm. I'm not doubting you're going to hear something about this at New York Comic-Con. Yeah. And all points in between. The yeah. minute you hear yeah. something about this, jump on it because – the Disney Plus deal sounds like it is the best deal for the bargain. Oh God, yeah, because you got to figure it's anything Disney has ever made, and I mean Disney uh, Pictures, Disney Animated, Disney Live, you know, everything plus Fox, plus Marvel, plus Lucasfilm. There's a lot of stuff there, right? For Warner Brothers to make this move, it, it's it's a good move for them, but this is just this the showing sign of the times that mm-hmm. if everybody's jumping on the streaming service, you really got to come with something. To get people to spend money on it, right? And they're doing it. This is loaded with oh, stuff. Oh yeah, so yeah. so it's it's definitely worth your while for all the programming you're going to get with it. And then what this means for cable networks? I mean, this is up in the air. This is yeah. I it's I I don't see cable. You know, obviously wrapping up shop anytime no. soon. No, but it'll it'll hurt them a little bit. But this is going to hurt. I mean, this is definitely going to become a battle for battle. Yeah. To, to say the least, like this is going to be something for you, the consumer, to spend your money on. You got to get your money's worth. For how Warner Brothers plays this off, I mean, they're off, they are offering a lot. Mm-hmm. So this will be worth the investment if you like the programming that they are having under this umbrella. It's hard to say no to, but then you kind of have to look at it and realize, okay, with my budget, okay, can I pull this off? Right. Because you still got Netflix. You still got Hulu, mm-hmm. which... I wouldn't doubt that something maybe happens with Disney Plus, and maybe that's kind of absorbed since they're all under the same umbrella. Yeah, they talked about it at their announcement thing a couple months ago, but they haven't really expounded on that any further. Right. I think after Disney Plus is up and running, you might hear a little something more yeah. than that. Yeah. You still have Amazon coming out, too? Oh, yeah. Amazon uh, Prime has still got their thing going. They got the Lord of the Rings series coming out. And I believe The Boys is coming out on that, too. Yeah, yeah. Which, get ready for that one, folks. I cannot wait to start reviewing that show. Either way. Warner Brothers is making a big move. Big Uh move. And this was some huge news. So hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. What is your thoughts on this? Are you excited about hearing everything coming to the streaming service? Are you kind of saying HBO Max is too much? I don't know what my general feeling is. Wait and see. As long as it has Doom Patrol on it, will I buy it? That might be my case. But either way, hit us up. Let us know what you think about HBO Max because we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. The ODPH is proud sponsors of Robocon 2019, happening September 28th and 29th. Don't miss out on Binghamton, New York's biggest sci-fi, fantasy, and gaming convention of the year. For badge details and more info, check out Robocon.org. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, and we're going to kick off one shots a little early because, like I said, everybody's gearing up for next week in Comic Con, mm-hmm. and we're going to go full detail for San Diego. Yeah. So until then, though, we do still got some stories we're going to break down to you. So Pat, why don't you kick us off with those one shots? Well, well, it's funny you mentioned San Diego Comic Con. Uh, we got some interesting Star Wars news, particularly related to Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker coming out. Uh, there's going to be a figure coming out uh, at San Diego Comic Con uh, next week. That is a red stormtrooper. Now I'm going to show you the picture there. Red stormtrooper. Okay. Uh, interesting title to this uh, stormtrooper. This stormtrooper already has a name. It is called the Sith Trooper. Now this trooper, mm. if you if you look up the picture, because I'm sure it's already circling Twitter and the internet like crazy, uh, you might think it's oh it's it's like those guards that were in uh, the Last Jedi, the Praetorian guards that were in that fight scene between Rey and Kylo Ren. No, uh, it is not that because those are named Praetorian guards and this is named Sith Trooper. I mean, the interesting for me is one that's a killer uh, paint job on that costume. That's amazing. Job. That's a it's that's a, a re- you can find the picture. Yeah, no, that's a really cool looking uh, picture. But the interesting thing for me is that is this is specifically called a Sith trooper because obviously the title sith was dropped you know about every five seconds in the prequels and anything to do with the prequels and that's not a knock it's just how it was but you really didn't hear anything about the sith in the uh, original trilogy obviously and in in terms of the sequel trilogy i don't think the sith have ever been really name dropped like uh, yeah you name dropped palpatine and all that but you never really heard sith proper dropped right so this is kind of the first inkling we've got of the title sith in the sequel trilogy, whether that means anything or not, 
Who's to say? We'll find out. Uh, it, it'll be definitely interesting to see anything that comes out of San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, also, I uh, want to give a little bit of a review. Went and saw Toy Story 4 over the weekend. And okay. I, and I got to say, uh, to sum up the film in a word, I am trash. No, that is not a knock on the film. That's probably one of the one of the one my favorite lines out of the film from the character Forky. Uh, it's a great film. Uh, if you grew up watching the Toy Story films, you'll enjoy this movie. You know, it, it's another great film from the folks at Pixar. Probably my favorite part of the movie has got to be Key and Peel because it's just classic Key and Peel. where there's several points in the movie where they're trying to come up with the, where the core group of toys are trying to come up with a plan to do something. And when Key and Peel join in the thing, they're into the into the fray. They're like, all right, here's what we're going to do. And it's always the most outrageous. Like there's one point in the film where they've got to get a key from an old lady who runs an antique shop. And, and they're like, all right, here's what we're going to do. So it, it, they show the two of them standing in like this this antique case looking thing and she walks by and goes oh where did you come from and they just leap up and attack her hmm. like it's it's just one of it's just classic key and peel comedy they're really good i can't recommend the movie enough i i can see them doing something after this film just because of the way it ends i won't spoil it in case you want to go see it i can see them doing something after this you know like a toy story 5 or a spinoff or something like that just with the way it ends i don't want them to though because it, it's a nice send off. You know, it's kind of like I kind of equate it to an epilogue of a book where Toy Story 3 is kind of the end of the story. And, and this is kind of the epilogue. It's a it's a really good film. It's a really fun film. There's a moment in the end of the film where I'm not going to lie. I, I teared up a little bit. It, it, was, it was a little emotional, but Lord knows Pixar's good at those moments. But like I said, if you're a fan of the Pixar movies or you grew up watching Toy Story like I did, you know, way back in the, in 95 and even into the later movies, definitely give it a go see. Yeah, this is really interesting to hear because, you know, what with Toy Story, you figure, okay, it would have been done after maybe two. Right. After three. But the fact they've gone to four and, mm-hmm. and obviously if, you, if you're saying they should just end it at four. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Like I said, with the way four ends, they could very easily spin it off into one of two directions. There, there's, you know, one way this, uh, I won't. I'm really trying to be vague about it. But with the way the story ends, they could do a film with with the way it goes. But I, I really don't want them to because, to me, with the way it ends, it, if you do a sequel after that, it just wouldn't be the same. Hmm. And that makes sense, too. I mean, it's kind of ran its course. I mean, I think it's mm-hmm. gone. It, it blew up further than I think anybody was expecting to. Yeah. I mean, it, it was definitely a major hit when it came. the original one came out in 95 and kind of revolutionized in, in the animated film industry where it was like the first of its kind to be a fully animated 3D film where and, and even you see how far it's come where. You know, there's a mo- there's kind of like a montage at the beginning of Toy Story Four with like everything that's happened up to this point, and and obviously Andy in Toy Story One does not look like Andy as they portray him here, but technology's changed since they were making this film in the early '90s. You know, it's it's just incredible to see how far this stuff has come, and, and just just you really feel like you've grown with these characters over the years. Where like I like I said, I remember when the film came out in '95 and going to see it at the theater with my family, and just that was one of the movies that was in regular rotation with my brother and sister at home when we were kids. That was just one of our favorite movies. I remember going to see two when we were a little older and and just being over the moon excited for it. It, It's just kind of wild to see to have one of those franchises that, you know, you really grew up with and now you're here, you're here as an adult going, you know what? I feel like this is the end and I'm okay with that. I hear you. I'm going to be like the same way with Fast and Furious. <laughs> That'll be never. <laughs> yeah, when that happens. No, but that's awesome about Toy Story, though. I've been meaning to go check that out, so I'm excited after your review. Mm-hmm. And, Pat, you got some Game of Thrones news? Yeah, so we got, of course, Game of Thrones wrapped up shop a couple of months ago here, but we do have the upcoming Game of Thrones prequel on the horizon. And uh, we got it. it uh, George R. R. Martin, of course, the creator of Game of Thrones, uh, did an interview with uh, Entertainment Weekly and kind of pulled the curtain back a little bit on what we should expect with the series coming forward. Uh, of course, the show is rumored to be called The Long Night or The Longest Night, whatever they go with, uh, and is going to be a far different Westeros than uh, what we were used to in the eight seasons. And I think it's five bucks uh, currently out. Uh, he said, quote, we talk about the seven kingdoms of Westeros. There were seven kingdoms at the time of Aegon's conquest. But if you go back further, then... There are nine kingdoms, then there are nine kingdoms and 12 kingdoms, and eventually you get back to where there are 100 kingdoms. 
petty kingdoms. And that's the era we're talking about. Uh, he went on to say, quote, the Starks will definitely be there. Obviously the white walkers are here or as they're called in my books, the others. And that will be an aspect of it. There are things like dire wolves and mammoths. Uh, the one thing he did say though, that won't be included in this are the Lannisters, uh, because he said, quote, the, the Lannisters aren't there yet, but Casterly rock is certainly there. It's like the rock of Gibraltar. Uh, it's actually occupied by the Casterlies, for whom it's still named after in the time of Game of Thrones. Uh, so it's not, so from what he's saying, you know, the, the Lannisters just aren't there yet. They're not a thing yet, but he kind of teased in that we may see how the Lannister house is formed in this show. But, you know, it's sound, it's sounded very interesting that, you know, you're, you're used to eight seasons of the seven kingdoms, the seven kingdoms, the seven kingdoms. It, this is making it sound like it's going to be like a free for all, like fight for yourself here. So let me ask you this. After you're hearing all this information, you're one of the biggest Game of Thrones fans I know. I'm not one of them, yeah. Are you excited about this? A little bit. I mean, I'm still kind of I'm, I'm kind of trepidatious after how bad the eighth season was. So I'm kind of like, I need to see some stuff first before I see this. Am I always excited for more Game of Thrones? Yes. Am I excited for anything that fleshes out the backstory that they hint at enough times in that show? Yeah. I'm just kind of like, all right, what are we going to see? And is it, are you going to try and make some corrections or make this at least better than season eight of Game of Thrones was? Because I think season eight is going to have left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths for a, a decent amount of time to come. Yeah, I, I'm like, I'm just not really amped up about this yet. I, I need to see some footage. Yeah, and, like I'm like, all right, it's, it's cool and all, but I got to see something before I'm like, all right, let's go. Yeah, because anytime you do a prequel story, mm -hmm. you really got to have something unique. Right. You're going to do this. Right. And, and obviously, like we said before, doing a prequel kind of ties your hands when it comes to certain things but i think the way martin is setting this up and i think hbo is going to be setting this up this isn't going to be like a lord of the rings move a hobbit film prequel or even a star wars prequel where you got to get to a certain point certain things got to happen so you almost you know like when you're watching clone wars you're like all right i know what's going to happen with this character that character that character but i think with this they're setting it so far in the past that they're going to be kind of not behooven to any, all right, well, we've got this character introduced and we got to make sure they get killed because it gets mentioned that they get killed by this person at this place. I think that's kind of the one benefit they're going with setting this so far in the past that like the Lannisters aren't even a thing. They might be able to like plant some seeds for some stuff down the road, but like they're not behooven to like, all right, we got to make sure that this house is running this by this point. Hmm. It's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah. Like I say, I just need a little more time away after game of Thrones. Maybe I'll get amped up for it again, yeah. but we'll have to see. So going into my one shots, so we were talking about everything coming to HBO Max, and, and I started thinking, okay, what other comic properties are coming to Netflix? Because okay. I, I think I'm like I'm missing one, and it's sure. hitting me in the head. And it is because it threw me off when I heard about the show. Okay, because there is one property that's oh. coming. Oh yeah, that I was going. Okay, well, if everything from DC and DC related is getting moved, what's going to stay on Netflix? And the show that just jumped out to me as soon as we went to break was Sandman got announced. Uh -huh. The Neil Gaiman DC Vertigo icon yep. is now coming to Netflix. Mm -hmm. And it's a massive deal Yeah, to do. It's 11-episode order. Neil Gaiman is going to be hands-on with David Goyer producing it. And this is going to be just interesting. I mean, the fact that this is going, and if you've never read Neil Gaiman's Sandman, it is... Just classic. It is just fun like trying to put it into words. It, it's tough because there's just so much multi-layered storytelling going on. It's a phenomenal read. It's you know the story about Morpheus and the, who is the Lord of the Dreams and and the Endless and it mm -hmm. just it goes into a lot of different directions. But it's so beautifully written to see it now come to screen because it's been rumored it was going to be a movie for the longest yeah, time. Yeah, and I remember that uh, from. Uh, Dark Knight returns or rises there. Uh, Jordan Gore, Joseph, Joseph Gordon Levitt, thank you, was like tagged with it for like the hmm. longest time, hmm. like at least from my memory. Right. So now with it coming to Netflix, I mean, this is huge news, huge. Yeah. And I'm just kind of going, okay, well, this might be the only DC property that's going to stay there. Right. I think for the price tag that's on it, because it's going to be a very expensive one to see. And just like I said, from where this is one of the most iconic characters of dc vertigo like i said when you talk about that imprint and just at that time period like i mean we did the blog about it on parlay points when dc vertigo came out i mean it was a time where you started seeing the mature readers line really blossom mm -hmm. and for dc to take a shot with it they did 
and rolled you know Sandman, which I mean was always a mature reader's book, mm-hmm. but to really become the forefront of that line. Yeah, and the only one character that I think really stood out, in my opinion, is Garth Ennis's preacher. Yeah, that just was like the two characters when you associate that line and just the brand and the quality of the book that comes with it. And Neil Gaiman is like I said, Sandman has been used very sparsingly throughout. Mm-hmm. I think the most recent time I've seen him pop up in the DCU has been um, DC Metal. Right. The Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo did just this quick cameo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But other than that, like, you, the character is always laid low because, I mean, Neil Gaiman has written that thing and you just make that just iconic. Mm-hmm. And you, you just shouldn't go near it. So to see this show come to Netflix is huge. Oh, yeah. Big deal. Yeah. But with Gaiman on board, I have full faith in it. Yeah. I think it's going to be incredible to watch. And like I said, if you got the chance to read it, read it. Oh, yeah. And speaking of that, I did hear that there was going to be a new John Constantine book tied mm-hmm. into the Sandman universe. So he's yeah. getting moved out of the DCU yeah. for right now and kind of going into, I believe, what they're calling the Sandman universe line. Right. And that's going to be something to watch, too. And maybe, I don't know if we'd have a John Constantine crossover in, in said Netflix, but don't rule it out. Either. Well, I, I think I got to kind of rule it out because uh, something that came up as we were recording, uh, Matt Ryan has confirmed that he's going to return for season five of Legends of Tomorrow. Uh, and he said that he would love to explore more of the dynamic between Constantine, Sarah, and Mick Rory uh, in the fifth season. So you got that going on. Hmm. Uh, the other interesting one, it's funny you mentioned Netflix and things coming to Netflix. There was a major announcement of something coming to Netflix, a little film called Red Notice. Okay. Now, now a lot of people may be going, Red Notice? I haven't heard of that. Uh, uh, I am one. Uh, so it's expected November 13th of 2020, and the IMDb page uh, description lists it as, An Interpol agent tracks the world's most wanted art thief. Uh, it is written and directed by Ross and Marshall Thurber. Uh, if you don't know the name, you might know what he's done. Uh, he directed movies such as uh, We're the Millers and Doc dodgeball so he's had uh, okay. but uh the current listed act list in the uh that was announced when this got announced the other day gal gadot wonder woman mm-hmm. ryan reynolds deadpool and dwayne johnson the rock uh-huh. going to netflix so this movie was originally going to be a universal pictures film but for whatever reason it ended up moving over to netflix and netflix is going to put the thing out so this is very easily probably going to be one of the most expensive things netflix has ever put out that's all i'm running through my head right now is the numbers between that and sandman uh uh-huh. holy sugar cookies man. yeah yeah but uh, this cast alone between wonder woman deadpool and the rock like yeah i'm all ready for this like give it to me now that is a star-studded movie. Uh-huh, and that's just three people. Like, that's not even a full cast. Wow. That's, I mean... Yeah. I'm just wrapping my head around, like, this is the first time I'm hearing about this, so you're getting my genuine reaction about this. Yeah. That is huge. Oh, it's insane. Yeah, just the... And, and obviously, the director's got a great track record. I mean, you go... Where the Millers is, I think, a very underrated film. It's a very funny movie. You know, if you if you can find it, maybe in your, like, a five, $5 movie bin or something, or even on online on, like, iTunes or something. But... You know, Dodgeball, classic movie. The comedy is there, and, and he's worked on some other stuff with Dwayne Johnson. I So they got the chemistry there. I think this has got the potential to be a very funny movie. Oh, the, the lineup, it should. Just just like a lock, Ryan Reynolds, and Dwayne Johnson in a room for like 15 minutes in this movie, and just the one-liners going back and forth. And throw Gail Godot in there, too. Right. Can we, can, can we get Jason Statham in this movie, too, just for the, like, because already Dwayne Johnson and Jason Statham have great one-liners back and forth between the two of them. Throw Ryan Reynolds into that mix, and we have comedy gold. I mean, this is just a huge move for Netflix. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess it's kind of like, okay, I see what you're doing with HBO Max. Hold, mm-hmm. Give me a sec. Hold my beer. Hold my beer. Let me come back. I mean, between that and, and Sandman, I mean, mm-hmm. that's that's a big, big budget for yeah. both. Yeah. Big. Wow. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just wrapping my head around the numbers. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, Netflix is going to go definitely into this battle with, with two big weapons in, uh-huh. in tow. So yeah. this is going to be interesting to watch. Do we have a timetable when this movie is, or just it's been announced that IMDb, they're IMDb, to it? IMDb says it's expected November 13th, 2020. We know how Netflix is. They're very cagey about when things are getting released. Lord knows they announced uh, season two of Lost in Space is coming, but I'm still waiting for that to come out. We'll, you know, when they're ready to announce it, they will. What if, I'm just going to throw this scenario out. What if they do it the same day that 
HBO Max comes out. Oh, that'd be ballsy. I mean, it, it would be. That'd be it, ballsy. It, it would be, but let's let's just the only it. the only thing that could possibly throw a monkey wrench into this is I know some of the the movie writers I follow on Twitter were kind of discussing this yesterday. Like they were trying to figure out when this would come out based on the Rock's film schedule because, if as everyone knows, the Rock is a very busy individual. Yeah, probably he, busiest man in Hollywood. Busiest man in Hollywood. If he has a day off, it is a rare blessing. Uh, the man is seemingly always working between movies and his HBO show ballers and everything else he's involved with. Um, there might be some juggling around of his, of his shooting schedule, but yeah, no, if they pull this off and they can get it out like the same weekend that HBO max launches, who shot across the bow there. That would, I'm like I said, I am just trying to wrap my head around this because this is just absolutely crazy. Cause you think about everything he's got coming out mm-hmm. and especially with he's uh, gonna have some tie into what they're still doing the Black Adam spinoff, mm-hmm. which is supposed to come out too, which ties in with Shazam. Which ironically they did release quietly online the bonus scene that nobody saw in the theaters. Yeah, which alludes to the fact that, that movie's coming. Mm-hmm. I mean, when the Rock is gonna have time to do this is anybody's guess. Let alone Ryan Reynolds and Gail Godot. I mean, right? They're they're gonna be <sighs> trying to pull this off. Is gonna be a, a, something huge. But if Netflix can do this, right? And like I said, if they time, if they really want to get some thunder back after HBO Max comes out and Disney Plus, yeah, this is the way to do it. But. Right. He, like we said, he's a very busy individual. I mean, if you go to his IMDb page, which, you know, take with a grain of salt, he can be attached to really anything if you think about it. His IMDb page lists him in 13 upcoming projects with Jumanji, The Next Level, and uh, Hobbs and Shaw this year, and then Jungle Cruise and Red Notice as next year. And then he's got one, two, three, four, five, six movies listed as in development, and then three listed as in production. I mean, if, if they can pull this off, because like I said, just because somebody's tagged to it doesn't mean it's, it's actually going yeah, down. Yeah. But if they pull this off, I mean, this is a huge win for Netflix. Mm-hmm. And like I said, they can piggyback this with Neil Gaiman and Sandman because right. th- that's going to be a, I don't know, any casting is anybody's guess with that. Right. But to bring that series to life, mm-hmm. I mean, those are two big productions. Right. And the thing with the movie, the Dwayne Johnson movie, those three names are going to be in the film because you had sites like Variety and Hollywood Reporter both saying that they're all going to be in the film. So anybody else that's attached to this movie at this point until it's from somebody, one of the reputable sites like a Variety, like a Hollywood Reporter, it's a little speculation. I mean, that's huge. That's big, big news. Jesus, I mean, stay them though, please. I mean, you can make that happen. That's. I mean, with that price tag, though, just with production costs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, go big or go home, I guess. Is say, it, is Dwayne it, Johnson, don't do anything uh, half-bald. No, and this is something that, I mean, like, this is a big win for Netflix. They can pull that off. He's a full-bald man. He absolutely is. That's all we got for this week. So for Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Ken. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.